Hello, welcome uh, everyone to a new uh, museum talk. Welcome to the museum talk of Ina Klaassen. Very happy that she accepted our invitation to come to our campus and talk about the depot of Museum Boymans van Beuningen. Without any doubt, doubt, I can say that the concept of the depot is developed, as developed by Boyman, Boymans van Beuningen is groundbreaking. Thanks to this depot, the relationship between the visitor and the museum has changed drastically. The visitor now gets a privileged view behind the scenes, or should we just say that there are hardly any screens anymore? And the functioning of the museum is now thoroughly shared with the public. Ina Klaassen, who's one of the museum's directors, is the driving force behind the depot. We should therefore consider ourselves very lucky that we will hear more about her ideas and this, of course, firsthand. Ina Klaassen grew up in Groningen. She studied audiovisual art at the Minerva Art Academy in Groningen. And at the University of Groningen, she studied art and art policy. And many years later, I was there also a lecturer at that uh, department in the University of Groningen. Before joining Boymans, uh, Klaassen served as director at the Willem de Koning Academy in Rotterdam and as director of fine arts in Artes University of Applied Sciences. Klaassen worked for the municipality of Rotterdam for more than eight years in various positions, including deputy director and head of policy and research at the arts and culture department. Then she came to Boymans van Beuningen and in 2019, she became the second director of the museum next to Shadow X. Thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Well. <laughs> Thank you. I will need my glasses to see it, so I probably look at a bit vague at you uh, once in a while, but um, well, I'm trying to combine the letters and looking at you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here at the University of Leiden and talk to you about the museum and the depot in the light of the public-private partnership that characterizes the history and the development of Museum Boymans van Beuningen. To understand the concept of the depot, I will start by giving you more insight in the museum's history, followed by a description of the depot, and I'll end this presentation with a sketch of the museum's future. Uh, oh yeah, don't forget to... So, there he is. The museum was founded in 1849 uh, uh, after a large private donation by a collector, Mr. Boymans, uh, to the city of Rotterdam. Mr. Boymans was a lawyer and he lived in Utrecht and he first offered his collection to this city, but the city refused his offer. So a friend of his uh, persuaded him to offer it to the city of Rotterdam and um, it took quite a couple of years for the city to um, accept the collection. The prospect of high costs of maintenance made the city council quite hesitant. And once it decided to accept the collection, the city made the accommodations available in the upper floors of the Schielandhuis, and thus the first public-private investment in the museum was a fact. The first decennium of its experience, the museum shared the, bil the building with the police station and the general surgeon for public women. At the time of its establishment, the collection of Museum Boymans consisted of approximately 7,000 works of art and objects, with in addition more than 650 paintings, a collection of prints, drawings and oriental porcelain. The, this is the Schielandhuis. Uh, the collection, uh, the museum was set up in a typically 19th century museum in which the paintings were hanging from ceiling to floor, and with the exception of drawings and prints, almost the entire collection was on display. There was no depository. 15 years after the museum was founded, a major fire broke out and two thirds of the collection was lost. After the fire, the insurance money was used to purchase new works of art in a higher quality. Until the 1920s, the collection grew mainly through donations and legacies and the museum's resources were relatively limited. In the 1920s, uh, yeah. In the 1920s, Rotterdam grew into the largest world port in Europe, and quite a few men made their fortune. These Rotterdam so-called port barons were very internationally oriented 
and they were trading in different continents. They were very well informed about international developments of art and culture and also of the art market. Moreover, after World War I and the Russian Revolution, a lot of art came onto the market. And in 1929, after the stock market crashed, even more came onto the market. In particular, art from collections of European noble families was offered for sale on a large scale, and Europe was impoverished, and much of that art, and also the ethnographic heritage, ended up with very wealthy industrialists in the United States during the crisis of the 1930s. The vast cultural wealth of Europe was shipped en masse to the United States and can still be seen today in the breathtaking collections of museums as the Chicago Art Institute, the Metropolitan in New York, the National Gallery in Washington, the Philadelphia Art Institute, but also smaller cities such as Cleveland, Detroit, and Pittsburgh have acquired incredible collections with their origins in the private collections of the great industrialists who bought up the art of Europe on a large scale. In that sense, the whole collection of the municipality of Rotterdam in some ways is comparable to that of the major American art museums. In Rotterdam, the collection was divided between the Art Museum, Museum Boymans van Beuningen, the Ethnographic Museum, the Maritime Museum, and the Historic Museum. The art collections and the ethnographic collections in the United States, however, were brought together uh, under one roof in huge museum palaces in the major cities. Uh, the collection that became the Museum Boymans van Beuningen collection in Rotterdam has grown into the most renowned of the four mun municipal uh, collections, although the collection of the ethnographic art from the Wereldmuseum is of exceptional quality as well. And in this respect, the collection of the Boymans Museum is not a noble collection, like the many museums in European capitals, but it's more a bourgeois collection. In the 1920s, the ambitious young director of the museum, Dirk Hanema, maintained close contacts with the collecting port barons. Some of them sat on the museum's supervisory committee, which also sanctioned the museum's purchases. In those days, it was common for museum directors to advise private collectors on art purchases in the hope that works of art or entire collections would later belong to the museum. However, this sometimes led to critical comments in the newspapers about the museum where the power would be in the hands of wealthy entrepreneurs. It seems that in the early 1920s, the communist opinion was that cultural heritage was of a public interest and should be safeguarded from the power of wealthy entrepreneurs. And a little sidestep, so if any one of you have followed the Dutch newspapers in the last 10 years regarding the funding of the depot, or more recently, the funding of the renovation of the museum, uh, you'll notice that in this respect, nothing has really changed in the last 100 years. In broad layers of the Dutch society, it's understood that public art collections must be free from pri private interference. But on the other hand, uh, it's the government, government that's stimulating the entrepreneurship of cultural institutions and the reliance on private donations. These days, however, the advising of private collectors by museum directors is regarded by many people as a conflict of interest and therefore um, unethical. Think about the public debate about Beatrice Roof at the Stedelijk Museum. Back to uh, the museum. Incidentally, the Boymans Museum has already showing, been showing private collections in the 1920s and 30s on a regular basis. Collections in the fields of art and arts and crafts and design in particular were displayed at the museum, including the annual Christmas exhibition. In 1939, the Rotterdam Port Barons, following the American example, set up a foundation with the aim of supporting the museum in the broadest sense of the word, Stichting Museum Boymans van Beun, Stichting Museum Boymans, moet ik zeggen. This foundation also became the owner of a part of a collection of very high quality that is on a perpetual loan in the museum now. The foundation, still exists today and it still accommodates bequests and gifts from private individuals who do not wish to bequeath or donate to the municipality of Rotterdam. And the museum's current business club is also connected to this foundation. The Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and the Mauritshuis in The Hague had already brought together important collections of old masters, uh, old masters and as the name suggests, these are national museums funded by the national government. As early as in the 1920s, 
Rotterdam wanted the same thing. It was, after all, the second largest city in the country. However, the museum never became a national museum, and it remained a municipal museum that was largely supported by the citizens of Rotterdam. And maybe recently you have noticed the discussion popping up in the newspapers and by the city council in Rotterdam, um, because they're advocating actually to get a national status for the museum Boymans as well. Of course, it's very uh, opportunistic because they just want to share the costs of the investment of the renovation. Um, director Hanema and engineer architect uh, Van der Steur made plans in 1928 for a new museum to be built. And they traveled all over Europe and especially Scandinavia for inspiration. A bequest of the shipping agent G.W. Burger enabled the city of Rotterdam to build the new museum. There it is, in 1935. It opened its doors, and the collection, with, which has now been grown to some 17,500, so 10,000 more, I think, uh, was also displayed here in its entirety, with the exception of the drawing and the prints, of course. Uh, a novelty was that the museum had a relatively large hall for temporary exhibitions. The museum opened with the first blockbuster in the Netherlands, the exhibition Johannes Vermeer, really, <laughs> uh, origin and influence Fabricius, de Hoog and de Witte. For these temporary exhibitions, a very small depository was included in the building. It was about 50 square meters. Here's the interior. Uh, the layout of the museum was incomparable with the full 19th century display in the Schielandhuis. The works of art were hung spaciously in rooms with daylight so that the individual quality of the works could be done justice. Yet, in the architecture and the layout of the museum's permanent collection, one can still see clearly the origins of the collection, a bourgeois collection. The rooms of the museum were largely of living room uh, format for the works of art that were also of living room format. The collection had originally hung in the houses in the country estates of the port barons. The furnishings, the curtains, the, cap the carpets, the fireplaces and the chandeliers were also reminiscent of that domestic setting. In the period 1935 till 1958, the collection experienced an enormous growth as a result of extensive donations, but also due to the purchase of a few collections from private collectors. An exceptional highlight was the acquisition by the municipality of Rotterdam of the collection of 288 artworks from the heirs of Mr. D.G. van Beuningen in 1958 for 18 million guilders. Uh, that paid for the heirs inheritance tax. Uh, important masterpieces from Mr. van Beuningen, a uh, private collection, had previously come into the possession of the Museum Foundation through gifts. And from then on, the museum was called Museum Boymans van Beuningen, which is sometimes a bit difficult for the international audience does it refers to the close relationship between the museum and its private collectors. Uh, some of them uh, are these. Maybe uh, pay a little bit of attention to the guy on the upper left. He's Mr. Van der Form, and I'll talk about him a little bit later. Uh, the museum's collection is therefore an encyclopedic and eclectic one in which the tastes, tastes and the preferences of the private collectors are visible to this day. The collection now comprises of 152,000 objects of art and design from the Middle Ages to the present day. More than 2,000 individuals have donated over 50,000 artworks. Almost 40,000 artworks have been purchased from approximately 3,000 private collections. Moreover, the collection is most, the most international collection of the Netherlands. The museum has art from Germany, France, Italy, Great Britain, Sp uh, Spain, Scandinavia, etc., and from the Middle Ages to the present day. And naturally, almost all continents are represented in the modern and contemporary collection. Let's see. Oh, the Fabricius is still from Mr. Boymans, and the Titus from, from Beuningen. Impressionists. Yes. Surrealism, modern design, anything. Uh, with the growth of the collection and the development of art itself, um, the need to expand the museum grew again. In 1972, 
um, a new wing of the museum was opened, designed by the architect Alexander Baudon. The Baudon section is a modern building with large daylight halls with white walls, which are suitable for display of modern and contemporary art. Four depositories were built in the basement of this section of the building. However, this was by no means sufficient for the ever-growing collection. And in 1979, um, a new depository of 10,000 square meters was built for all municipal uh, collections for, of, uh, from Rotterdam, including that of the Museum Boymans van Beuningen. It was climatized and it was secure, and it was in an industrial area similar to many museums, uh, museum depots uh, these days in the Netherlands or abroad. Meanwhile, the prosperity in the Netherlands increased rapidly in the 1960s and 70s, and the government uh, stimulated the purchase of visual arts. Purchasing schemes, BKR, Kunstkoopregeling, 10% regeling, for art increased sharply, and more and more people could afford to collect art. The legitimacy, legitimacy of art policy shifted from beauty to welfare. Art education for the masses was introduced, and the number of visitors to the museum increased, as did the curiosity of the public about what was in those treasure chambers of the museums. In the 1980s and 90s, the storage of public collections began to raise questions in the international museum world, and also in the Netherlands. After all, a large part of these collections is not visible to the public. On an average, museums are able to display approximately 8% of their collection uh, in galleries or in international exhibitions. The first experiments with opening up depots, showing the storage of art, etc., made their appearances in the museums. In 1990, Museum Boymans van Beuning established an open depot in an exhibition hall. Racks were placed on which 100 works of art were hung. Okay, go ahead. Here you see it. Um, and next to this was a computer with a database of images of works of art from the collection that could be consulted by the audience. When the next extension to the museum, the Robrecht Dam wing, was opened in 2003, the next step was taken in opening the collection. On the ground floor, ground floor of the museum, was a digital uh, depot. It could be experienced by the audience in an interactive installation in which the public could visually browse through a collection. The digital depot had been made possible by a substantial gift of 650,000 euro from one of the collecting families that had been involved with the museum for many decades. Remember the guy on the upper left? That's the Van de Form family. He was uh, the first big Van de Form and he, he also his family donated this uh, digital depot. Uh, the fact that private investment was being made by the, um, in opening uh, up the public collection and not as usually is the case, contributing to an exhibition or an acquisition of an artwork that was telling. Unfortunately, technology was developing so rapidly that the digital depot was quickly becoming obsolete. The museum lacked the sources to continue investing in the technological innovation of the depot, and so it had to shut the de digital depot down. Um, however, the museum was not giving up on search of solutions to make the collection accessible to a wider, wider audience. Moreover, the lack of good quality storage for the collection was becoming an increasing, pro uh, an increasing problem. The depot were overcrowded, outdated, and since the late 1990s, the hardened subsoil of Rotterdam has caused the museum cellars to flood frequently. Floods that threatened the collection in storage and dampness that attracted vermin. The museum world's famous collection of prints and drawings was under serious threat. Um, in 2008, a print and drawing depot was realized on the ground floor of the museum. This time, the investment was made by the municipality of Rotterdam and the museum that was an independent foundation by them. Uh, the public could view the depot for the collection from behind glass, but prints and drawings could also be requested to be viewed on hand uh, under the guidance of a conservator or register, of course. The involvement of the private collectors in the museum was no longer 
only expressed in contributions for acquisitions, exhibitions, educations, and gifts and bequests. In the 21st century, exhibitions with entire collections of private collectors, often owners of large companies, could be seen in a museum with some regularity again, such as the Calde collection or the Van Huys van Zomeren, uh, van Hu van Huys van Zomeren collection. However, the print and drawing depot was on, uh, only a solution for the acute problem of the print and drawing collection, but not for the entire, entire collection, which was, as I explained, under serious threat. When the museum became independent in 2006, it had already sounded the alarm. The museum building was full of asbestos and the collection was threatened by flooding and vermin in the form of silverfish. The municipality, still owner of about 85% of the collection and the museum building, was ultimately in 2010 prepared to invest in a new depot for the museum. And this is where the story of the first, uh, oh, this is the depot on the first floor. Uh, this is a story um, of the world's, world's first publicly accessible art depot, which opened its doors in November 6 in 2021. Of course, the museum could have built a new depot uh, building like so many others, a closed box in an industrial area, area with a high fence and a mean dog. And then the collection would have been quite safe and high and dry, but it would not have been an answer to the problem of the limited visibility of the public collection, only 8% is on display, about 600 years works a year, uh, nor would it have been an answer to the question of how museums as an heritage institution is, remains or becomes um, sustainable, relevant to younger and more diverse generations of non-visitors. And uh, besides that, it would be, have been totally boring. Uh, the idea of the publicly accessible art depot was born, uh, but what, it exactly, uh, what that exactly was, we didn't know yet. And it was a rather abstract idea, I think. The depot would be an iconic building in the vicinity of the museum with space for storing a municipal collection, the collections on loan, and also storage space for private collectors. And while we were at it, a number of restoration studios, a restaurant, and a shop. Winnie Maas, uh, architect at Rotterdam-based MVRDV, was asked to make a design and an experiment as a thinking model uh, with which the museum could enter the dialogue with the municipality and the public. The idea was presented to the elderman. Uh, the most important question was from him, what does it cost extra such a publicly accessible depot? And the answer was, well, we think about approximately 15 million. Uh, that's on top of the 20 million that it would just cost us in this industrial area. And the elderman and the council thought that was too much. And the elderman said, well, if you f could find someone is crazy to give you the 15 million, be my guest and we'll talk again. Winnie Maas design became a scale model and was showed at the art fair uh, the Rai in Amsterdam. And the idea was picked up by the Dutch newspaper, the NRC. And sometime later, the museum received a call from someone who would like to come and talk about the museum depot. An appointment was made and a few weeks later, a man in a trench coat walked in with a newspaper under his arm. And he put the paper on the table and he said, what does it cost extra to have a depot accessibly to the public? Well, uh, 50 million. Okay, I'll give it to you. It was really as easy as that. And of course you think, who was that man? That man was Martijn van der Vorm. So he was the, uh, a grand nephew of the, the guy on the top left. Uh, the very wealthy nephew from Willem van der Vorm, who was intensely involved with the museum in the 1920s and 30s. And he was the founder of the Willem van der Vorm collection, which the museum had already on a perpetual loan from the 1970s. The reason that the very wealthy Martijn van der Vorm wanted to invest in the depot uh, was because he believed in the vision of the museum and because it would be an investment in a place where uh, the museum park, where the municipality had already been investing a lot, the Kunsthal, the NIE, now HANI, and it would increase the return on investment. From that moment on, things quickly became concrete. A technical program of requirements was written, um, and a competition was organized. 
MVRDV won the competition with a mirrored ball. The fact that the idea of a publicly accessible depot was not a very elaborated idea yet can also be seen at the program of requirements for the depot, which was actually just a technical program in which the public functioning of the building was not described. The museum had to work out the concept of a publicly accessible depot. Initially, we were thinking about 20% accessibility, but during the design process, it became clear that we should aim for complete transparency and accessibility. The advancing insight into the public character of the building left its marks on the design process, sometimes to the despair of the municipality and the architect. The depot is in principle a work building. I don't know a good English translation. A building where the museum is working with the collection, storing, conservating, restoring, carrying and collecting. But the design was spectacular and we got the impression that the exterior of the depot would suggest an even spectacular interior. Um, so to prevent any disappointments, we asked several artists to make an interior design. Marike van Diemen designed the life-size vitrines. Um, Uh, the life-size vitrines, and um, John Kermeling was asked to design the an entry hall. The depot is explicitly not a museum. It is the backstage of a museum. Backstage has become front stage. This is also in line with the public's growing desire to look behind the scenes. Think about the sewer system in Paris or the uh, engine room of a steamship. And the narrative in the depot is not about the meaning of art or the ideas of artists. That's the narrative of the museum. The narrative of the depot is about the object. In the depot, you can see how art is cared for and how it is collected. The presentation in the depot are therefore not art hysterical ex historical exhibitions, but presentations about the care and the collecting of art. The stories that are being told are about material, color, climate, technique, history, research, etc. The depo depot has a conservation center with four restoration studios for different materials, a framing studio and a photo studio. Through large windows, the public can closely follow the research and restoration being carried out there. On screens next to the studios, videos are shown with background information about the restoration process, materials, light, climate, research results. And in time, the public will also be able to look through the microscopes that can be connected to the screens. Most museums that manage large collections, like Museum Boymans and Beuningen, have virtually no budget for active conservation and restoration of artworks. Government subsidies and grants generally do not provide for this either. And in the past, recruiting for this has also proved to be quite difficult. But in the depot, visitors uh, proved to be very interested in everything that goes on in the conservation center. By making restorations visible, we also attract new gro groups of donors who want to commit to the pre preservation of the collection. And in addition to stories about the care of art, we discussed collecting itself. Collecting as a basic human need. After all, we all collect. Uh, but we also discussed the differences between the public and the private collecting of art. In this way, the museum has, a, has greatly broadened its repertoire. Let's see. Uh, the depot is, as it were, a lo new low threshold Google mountain of stories in which it can appeal to new audiences, especially people who have little experience or knowledge of art and museums. The depot is also much more democratic than a museum. All objects are cared for with the same attention and love whether it's a Pieter Breugel's Toren van Babel or a small glass vase from IKEA, the museum curators, in the museum, curators choose what is interesting to the public, but in the depot, the public can select and combine objects by its own eyes. Let's see. This is the entry hall by John Kermeling. Here you see something in the atrium, the large uh, vitrines. These are the depositories with the big windows. You can just see into the depositories. Here is the painting department, vault, great big objects. Okay. The broadening of the repertoire is important for the sustainable relationship with young and diverse uh, generations. Legitimizing heritage institutions is, uh, in a changing society is an interesting challenge. 
how do museums such as the Boymans with cultural complete Western art collections remain relevant to, uh, for a young and diverse public? Museums have had a monopoly on knowledge and taste since their inception of the 19th century. Our curators have a great deal of knowledge about the collection, but it is so encyclopedic, eclectic, and extensive that we really do not know everything about it. And the depot proves, you know, provides a space for the inclusion of the knowledge of the public. Of course, there is also a lot of knowledge about specific collection areas or works of art in our collection amongst the public. For example, we have a collection of lace, but we don't have a curator of lace. And when we were making an inventory uh, of the lace collection as a public project in preparation to move to the depot, many amateur clubs and individual enthusiasts came to the museum and were giving us a lot of information about the collection. Another example is in the depot we had a visit from a journalist who came to look at a painting of his, uh, by his grandmother. The work had never been uh, exhibited before and the information in the museum database was very limited. Um, it said, for example, that the work had been made between 1920 and 1940. That's pretty vague. And on the spot, he phoned with family members who could tell more about the work and when it was made, so we could actually add to our information. And uh, the depot does explicitly offers us the possibility of addressing uh, public knowledge, at, of adding public knowledge to our own. Museum visits have become a more reciprocal experience. We have also developed a communication tool for that purpose, the Depot app. With it, we can offer more in-depth information to the audience. Everywhere in the Depot you see QR codes and the visitor can scan the codes with their apps and read more about the content of the depositories, the artworks they see on display in the vitrines and in the galleries. And the app also gives us the opportunity to collect knowledge and preferences of the visitors and by asking them questions. The app will be further developed in the coming period to provide an even more rich experience. In addition to knowledge, personal experience and personal interpretation are of added value to the depot experience. Uh, the depot can be visited by buying a ticket online and exploring it on your own. There's also a free option for a guided tour. In a guided tour, the visitor in a Typhoon code and in a group of no more than 12 people uh, goes the, uh, in through the depot with a guide and a guard. Um, and you really go into the depot, the, the depositories. The guides are not um, uh, um, art historians, but they are ordinary Rotterdammers with a talent for telling stories and communicating with visitors. They are fed by the uh, scientific and educational staff of the museum, but they can tell their own stories. So the guide stories are not just standard pre-described texts, but they have a personal and individual approach that proves to be of added value to the public. In the depot, seven compartments are designed for private collectors, and we have one compartment, compartment where private individuals can rent space per square or cubic meter. The seven compartments differ in size and are all equipped with a depository, a showroom, and a pantry. And they are like private apartments in the depot. The presence of the private collectors in the museum gives us the opportunity to tell stories about the broader context of the art world, such as the difference in public and private collecting, in scale, size, value, budgets, tastes, the art market, and other kinds of developments. The motives of the private collectors for renting in the depot are very diverse. Exposure, legitimacy, patronage, support of artists, being taken care of, benefiting from the audience, network and the museum's reputation. Everything is possible. What is remarkable is that the private collectors use the depot in a completely different way than we anticipated. Firstly, the interest of the companies which collection, uh, with collections have proved to be strong whereas we have envisaged, uh, envisaged more private collectors for the compartments, but in general, they tend to be more interested in renting the space per square or cubic meter. What, um, the depot's tenants are very diverse as well. The compartment um, 
house the corporate collections of KPN and Rabobank, as well as private collections like the Lakeside collection. The use of the compartments is also very different. The Rabobank has turned its compartment into a kind of a gallery, of a museum gallery. Uh, it doesn't even store its own collection in the depot. Actually, it is in an external location, but they are just, well, kind of playing being a museum, which is really interesting because they have a really different collection as we do. KPN uses the storage facility uh, also for representative, representative actions or uh, events. So also their board uh, are regularly um, having meetings actually in the depot because it's such an inspiring um, um, environment. Um, but Lakeside, the private collection, um, gives part of the space to a young artist in uh, an, um, an art, uh, artist in residence uh, program. We have never thought about that, but uh, they do. So they actually, all these tenants, they add to the concept of uh, the depot, which is really interesting. And it also tells us a lot more about um, different parties in the, in, in, in the cultural world, I think. Um, recently, we have even onboarded a cultural institution, a Verhalenhuis Belvedere, uh, as a new talent. This institute collects stories and artifacts from various larger groups with migration background that live in Rotterdam. We're very excited about the interaction between this collection and that one of the Boymans. But the tenants that rent per square or cubic meter are also very diverse. Uh, for example, heirs of uh, deceased artists with large bodies of work, private individuals who have no room at home for an odd size piece of art, or works from uh, art of an inheritance that they don't want to store at home, but they also don't want to get rid of, or a collector's mania that has got out of hand and has no longer any place in his, house, his or her house. The museum, therefore, is not the only one to influence the depot's concept and operation. Tenants and the public also contribute to the, its contents and experience. But not only the repertoire and the narratives are important. The depot is also a business model. For the first time, we are exploiting the storage of collection, entry tickets by renting out storage space, uh, but also by offering art services, such as packaging and transport, cataloging, pest management, conservation treatments, etc. We raise funds and earn money for the care of the restoration of the collection. But in the longer term, it may also be that works can be added to the museum's collection. For some collectors, look for a good destination for their collection and in the end of, at the end of their lives, when there are no children or no children who are interested in maintaining an art collection, we are there. Bear also in mind that the museum's acquisition budget is only 50,000 euros a year. But as an average, we buy for about three or five million a year, always with the money of other people. So the closer we have of very wealthy collectors in the vicinity of the museum, the more uh, possibilities we have for expanding our own collection. Um, so, and so you could say that the new that we kind of developed a new museum typology. Uh, but the depot is not a panacea for every expanding museum collection and the limited visibility of the mu uh, public collection. For example, uh, if you would be a Van Gogh museum and you only have Van Gogh paintings, um, if you would have a publicly accessible storage, it would be not that interesting because it's just on display in a museum or on display in a storage space, but that's not interesting at all. The interesting thing with the Museum for Boymans is that we have Middle Ages till now, art and design, and it is uh, all kinds of different combinations you could make. That makes it so interesting, but it's not for every museum. Uh, for example, the V&A, uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, who's come to visit us uh, on many occasions, they're also uh, developing in the Docklands an, an open depot, publicly accessible depot uh, for their museum, but it's completely different. They have more kind of a, a pyramid model with uh, the, the tomb of the pharaoh in the middle, which is the highlight of the collection, and an interesting uh, route through the depositories, through this pyramid, which is completely different because you can look into the pyramid, you can see all these interesting spots, but you can never 
really enter. So it's more transparency than really accessible. It is different. But it's also very different, for example, than our colleagues uh, in South Korea, who actually, uh, that was very funny, they found our, uh, our um, program of requirements on the internet, and they already built uh, the depot. And then we got an email of them, said, well, we already built it, but we don't know how, could you send the team actually to um, train us to exploit uh, a publicly accessible depot, which was really interesting as well. So I think uh, new, new concepts, store, uh, storage concepts will emerge. Um, so it's not like being copied all around the world, but I think there will be many forms of public accessible depots in the next couple of decades. The international intention for the depot has been overwhelming though. Since the opening, 3,000 articles have been appearing in international media and over 3 billion people have been able to learn about the depot. Let's see. Oh yeah. He opened it. Um, this, these were the, the private collections. This is KPM. This is the Lakeside collection. Ali Kelis. And this is the project of Pippi Lotteriest. So even at night you can experience a really interesting uh, installation by Pippi Lotteriest. Actually there's a lot of uh, people coming there because uh, it starts when it's getting dark and people actually bring their own bottles of wine and beer and are sitting there and skating there at night and just uh, it's, it's a meeting place for young people actually at night. Um, now that the COVID pandemic has subsided, the public has returned and we've been in business for more than a year. And we are starting to discover what we have built and how we can work in the depot and how the public behaves in the depot, which is very different from the museum, I can tell. Um, it will take some time before we really understand what we have really built, I think. But the difference in the behavior of the public is especially that they kind of approach it as an event. When they first come in, they don't really know what to expect, so you have to explain quite a lot. But then uh, people go in and they are quite um, free in the way of they move. In, in, in a museum, it's kind of this holy silence and um, people are very careful not to talk very loud and not to run. But in the depot, the, the noise level is much higher and people are much more free to move around. Um, I think people experience it more like an event than a museum. That's what I think. Um, but for us, uh, for the museum, the depot is only the first step in developing an art museum for the future. A museum is th that is diverse, inclusive and sustainable as well as uh, current and relevant for large groups of people. In, 19, nee, in 2019, the museum closed its doors by order of the fire brigade. The maintenance of the museum had been neglected by the municipality of Rotterdam for decades due to the large scale presence of asbestos. However, the plans for renovation and the new construction were not yet ready. Meanwhile, the asbestos has been virtually removed and the prelimina pre preliminary design for the renovated and renewed museum is being drawn up. Because the museum will not open until the 1930s at the earliest, the museum has developed a so-called transit program. In the transit, uh, the transit consists of five program lines. The first one is Boimels in the classroom, uh, because um, we didn't think it to be acceptable that a whole generation of kids could not uh, would grow up without a collection of Boimels. We set up a program uh, where we brought the, the works of art from our collection actually really to the classroom. So we had we bought our own little van, and we went then to the, the school with. Um, uh, two art handlers and a guide, uh, a guard, and uh, we just brought it to the schools. And there was also an XL version that actually brought several works of art to the school, mostly to the, the, the biggest classroom or the gymnasium, where actually we could work with the kids to make our own exhibition with the works of art of the museum. Of course, we didn't bring the Tower of Babel. Yes, yes. We didn't. But of course, there's 152,000 works of art, and there's a lot of works that you can actually work with quite safe. Um, then we had Boymans at the neighbors. Um, it's always been a wish of our neighbors to use the collection of Boymans, but of course um, 
uh, we wanted to make exhibitions with our collection ourselves. But the, because we were closed, it gave us the opportunity to actually be generous to the neighbors, and not only museums, but also, uh, for example, the Erasmus MC, who uh, had a loan for a, a large statues from us. And um, actually, Drom and Daad um, sponsors, sponsored this program, and so there was a lot of uh, exhibitions uh, which uh, combined the um, collection of the Museum Boymans with collections of other museums. It was really interesting, and the program has stopped now, but everybody wants uh, want to continue this program. And Drom and Daad also um, invested in the other museums because their security level and the climate uh, wasn't okay enough to use the Boymans collection. And every uh, so everybody, um, yeah, uh, got lucky because actually they uh, invested in these museums. Um, then we also had uh, Zuid Boymans van Beuningen. So that is a, a, dip, uh, a dip and dance on the south bank of the city. South Bank is a deprived area where the average level of education is low, as are the incomes. And it is also many people with migrant backgrounds living there. Uh, South is an old school building where various cultural institutions and welfare organizations are using a number of spaces. The program of Zuid is focused on local residents. We do projects and exhibitions for, by and with the local residents. And we invite international artists to work with them. But we also provide after-school care for children who cannot or do not want to go home and offer them art education projects. And then we have Boymans International. A collection of Boymans belongs to the top 60 collections of the world and we have the ambition to double the amount of visitors after renovation. For the years up to the opening, we made a couple of international traveling exhibitions with the Boymans collection. For example, we have a famous surrealist collection, and that is traveling from New Zealand to Korea, Mexico, Denmark, Italy. And our impressionists were last year shown in uh, Leeuwarden, for example, and they will be traveling abroad after that. Uh, New Horizons is a thematic exhibition on contemporary art that will be traveling to Korea, Italy, and Taiwan. And in 2024, the top of the collection will be shown at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. This way, we are building up the museum's reputation so that a new international audience will find its way to Poymans from 2030 when we open the renovated museum again, we hope. Uh, Boymans projects. In Boymans projects, we experiment with exhibition formats uh, in the city at external locations, indoor and outdoor. A rather spectacular one was the Boymans drive through I don't know if anybody of you heard about it. It was in the large convention center of Rotterdam, Ahoy, uh, and, and we made a large-scale exhibition on ecological and social change. A selection of odd-sized works of art from the collection, were, uh, together with some commissioned works, were placed in a 10,000 square meter hall. And we were sponsored by Mini Cooper, a car dealer that loaned us uh, 36 electric Mini Coopers which uh, the audience could literally drive through our exhibition. This was really spectacular, but because it was in COVID, it was only people from Rotterdam coming over, actually. <laughs> All the projects in the transit program are aimed at creating an innovative uh, program, both in terms of content and exhibition format, as an inspiration for the new museum that will open in 2030, and with which we also want to connect to younger and more diverse audiences. This also means working with more different and new perspectives on the collection to become a more inclusive museum. The renovation, uh, here we see some pictures. This is the south. This is uh, the going to the classroom. Actually, this is the school of my daughter. Uh, this was uh, the drive through in Ahoy with the cars. Oh, yeah. the, resume, uh, the renovation. Um, the renovation and the new construction of the museum is uh, the second phase of the museum's transformation. The Van der Steur and Baudon sections will be restored in their former glory, and the Robrecht Dam and Henket sections will be demolished. The architecture of Van der Steur and Baudon sections followed the development of the uh, museum's art and collections at the time, uh, and this makes the architecture kind of part of the collection. In addition to the lack of functionality, the building components of the, that are to be de uh, demolished do not meet this quality. 
so we don't look upon them as part of the collection. The museum, the museum works uh, towards a clear programmatic uh, profiling of the various buildings or sections in which the art collection of Boymans is always the starting point. The sum of all the relatively autonomous buildings or sections, wings, will be Boymans van Beuningen. The arrangement of the collection will be on display uh, uh, again in the Van der Steur building se uh, section. And the Baudon section is and remains an exhibition machine for art and design through the ages. And the depot in the museums uh, is the museum's treasure room. Uh, the new construction in the museum park will be different from the other buildings or section wings. It will, be an it will not be an incubator for art, but it will be more kind of an arena or a colosseum, if you will, where you can actually work with water and fire, uh, where art can be created and the audience experience um, themselves as part of the program. Uh, the Boymans uh, educational program plays a prominent role at this new location, as will the Van der Steur and Baudon sections. The architecture will follow the development of the art itself again. Uh, the distinguishing feature of the Museum Boymans van Beuningen is its international collection of art and design, which spans seven centuries and offers an infinite amount of context for making programs with or without the collection. The development of art and design, as well as the universal ideas and values that are embedded in it. From this quality, the bridge is being built to contemporary art, um, that is multimedia and culturally di diverse. Art reflects society. It is a reflection on what divides us and what connects us. The link between future generations and the museum collection will be based on the topicality and urgency of the contemporary art. The museum wants to offer visitors an experience that broadens the mind and strengthens the heart and is a place for pleasure, knowledge, connection, cultural citizen citizenships, identity, self-esteem and pride for the people of Rotterdam and visitors from far beyond. The active interaction between the museum and the public, uh, with which Boymans is now experimenting and gaining experience in the south, uh, in the depot, is of eminent importance for the development of the program of the Boymans of the future. So whether we're talking about investing in bricks and mortar, acquisitions for the collection or creating a program for the museum in the future, Museum Boymans van Beuningen is a public-private endeavor. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, very illuminating uh, talk. It's, it's, it's interesting how to see that, that it's a totally new concept, but still it has its foundation in, in history and really wanting to work with a a collection, different collections, bringing different collections together and also trying to get even more people to not only to the museum but at least at the collection yeah. in, in that way and also different ways of looking at a collection and different way of displaying or bringing people into contact with it. So that was absolutely fascinating. Are there questions? First question. Hi, uh, we met before. My name is Florence. Thank you for your really insightful talk. Um, I was wondering, I, ho I hope this isn't a stupid question. You mentioned that you have more insight in visitor behavior. And I was wondering if you already, after a year of operation, have some insight in visitors that might be attracted or encouraged to visit the depot that would normally not visit the museum itself. Yeah, it, it's not hard data we have, but we do see a different audience coming. Uh, of course, um, uh, many uh, museums now these days see that the audience are becoming younger after COVID. So it's the younger audience coming back and we see that as well, but it, we think it is extra in the depot. So we see it in an age different, we see it in the behavior, we see it actually, um, uh, yeah, it's really hard to, uh, to explain, but you can see actually the regular museum visitor has a different appearance than people that are not used to go to a museum. Their behavior is different, the way they look is different. So it's not hard data we have yet. We are still collecting that. We started that about half a year ago, but my, um, I suspect that, that we actually see that it is a different audience that we attract. And there, w there are some people that are, and that is um, 
I think the regular uh, museum audience um, is strange. Some people actually are disappointed at the depot because it's not like a museum at all and others are interested. But the thing is, uh, when we try to make exhibitions in the depot, you see, for example, at this, uh, at this moment we have a Piranesi exhibition, which is actually about the watermarks in the, the paper of the, the prints. Uh, so it is about research, but the audience um, recognizes it as, as a museum uh, uh, exhibition. And actually, so that's something we will never do again because it's too much like a museum and not so much as a depot. So we're kind of trying to make it sharp. What is the difference between a, pre a presentation in a depot and a museum? So, the, um, yeah, we have to explain a lot about the depot and the people are behaving different. But it's, it's, it's not about hard data yet. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm uh, Rosalien van der Poel. And I uh, wonder, you said um, about people in Rotterdam who come and who um, want to donate their artworks because they have no place um, anywhere to don donate it anywhere uh, else. And you say, yeah, th then here are we. But there's a limit limit to that i think or sure. how do how do you no, select we're very selective we're yeah. really selective so it's not like uh, just come along bring no. your uh, work no. of art and uh, here we are now it's not like that it's more like the the collectors or the collections that are in uh, that are tenants actually in the in the building they have these vast collections and we kind of try to select them also to be complementary to our own collection or uh, within the same range so we also try to have um, um, co collections of high quality that actually could fit into the museum. Of course, when you rent out per square and cubic meter, this is uh, um, more difficult to actually select because it's also like a business model. But actually, it is true that uh, by um, attracting these collectors and bringing them really close to you, the chance of or having a co-financed uh, um, uh, purchase or you get more donations, it's just bigger. And we see that already. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if, um, would there any, would you have to, uh, do you want to have anything different in a depot at this moment? Are there things you have learned and you wish you could have changed in the process? Yeah, uh, a lot of things. <laughs> uh, I wish we had a better uh, program of requirements. I just already mentioned it a bit because we never thought that well about uh, the public function of the building. And actually, it takes a lot of uh, square meters. And if you see it, the de design of the uh, so this bowl, the, the main square meters are on the top. But from a public perspective, the main square meter should be at the bottom. And so we had to um, offer uh, like um, a, a lot of uh, art handling space uh, for the visitor's experience. So now we, we, we would have liked to have two truck dogs and we only have one loading dog. And we would have have a huge quarantine room. Uh, we only have a very small one now. So we really had to sacrifice a lot of space for the audience. So if we would have been faster in our way of thinking about uh, the, the public function of it, we probably would have a more balanced design. And um, also the thing that we experienced, that we never thought about it, but actually COVID opened our eyes of how um, the capacity of the building is actually not big enough for the amount of people that want to visit it. Um, because in the first um, few months, um, we had these regulations with the, the distancing. And then uh, we saw that the lift capacity, for example, was way too small to, to uh, accommodate many visitors. So we should have thought more about also bigger lifts, uh, elevators, I have to say, uh, elevators. And uh, the, also the, the clock room had to be much bigger. And so, yeah. But well... The, 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 of course, the collection will be growing, and in 20 years it will be completely full, and we have to build, bring, uh, build the next depot next to it or so, and then we do it all better. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Mm. I'm interested in the um, 
in what I call the museum, because I think uh, I haven't visited yet. That's also the reason I'm asking these questions. Uh, there's a museum and there's the depot. I understand that the museum will be closed until 2030. Yep. So that's for seven years again, uh, still. Uh, so what has happened to the collection of the museum at this moment? For example, you mentioned the Tower of Babel. Is that, uh, well, is that hidden until uh, 2030? Or is it, uh, is it shown somewhere else? No, actually so everything is on display but in storage. Of, but the Tour of Babel, we have one of the galleries, we have three gallery spaces in the, in the depot, and one okay. of them actually has a selection of the highlights. And that's because the museum isn't open yet. So we made a special presentation about the highlights, and actually we did it in an exhibition format of Lina Bobardi, which is these clays, um, um, yeah, stan standards actually, on concrete, which shows the... Uh, the highlights of the collection um, in a democratic way. So there's like soldiers in a row and just everything together from Basquiat next to uh, Breugel to uh, Jan van Eyck to uh, uh, Mondrian, everything, but with their backs to the public. So if you enter the space, you just see the backsides of the, of the works, of the paintings. Uh, and, and there's a lot of stories to show about the backsides of the paintings as well. So you start the other way around. You're not looking at the pictures, you're looking at the backside, the stamps, um, some letters are being glued at the act. Um, so the, the backside, for example, for the Tower of Babel, there's a, uh, a letter from a previous owner stuck to the backside, which is really interesting, another story for the people to tell. So the highlights we are showing in the depot, but we would never do that when the museum would be open. This is just to accommodate the public because we see that people from Rotterdam actually miss their collection, so they yeah. want to see the, the Titus from, uh, and they want to see the Tour of Babel. So um, it's so a compromise. The coming seven years is, is temporary, and over se in seven years, the museum will come back in its old form, and the depot no. will... No, never. <laughs> no, I think that the museum we closed in 2019 uh, won't exist in 2013 because the world has changed and actually we have to try to change with the world and kind of project that already in the new building on uh, 1930. We will of course show the collection in, in the Van der Stuur wing and the old museum but the way we will program the building will probably be completely different than we did in 2019 when we closed the museum. And we're bu building also the new building blocks for the museum will be different. There won't be these white cubes, but it will be these spaces where we can accommodate contemporary art, which is completely different. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, you mentioned uh, as like a... Um, uh, project in the future or next phase, the museum park. Um, and you described it as a sort of Colosseum. Um, and yeah, I was wondering um, if you could elaborate on that a bit more because with Colosseum, I think of spectacle and with the elements that you also spoke about. Um, but how, yeah, how do we, uh, how should we envision that? Uh, I think, um well, we have a problem with contemporary art sh being shown in the galleries of the museum in, the, in 2019, was that we couldn't show uh, all the contemporary artists, actually, because they're working in a completely different way. They don't need a, a, a white cube, uh, like this, this um, um, uh, couveuse, uh, where uh, artists treat it very carefully. Actually, the, 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 the contemporary production of art is completely di different. Multimedia, it's... Uh, um, so we, we don't, it's, so the Colosseum is not like for a Colossus, but like for, uh, um, you can do anything there. It is, it is a space that can accommodate any kind of uh, art, whether you work with water or fire, which normally you don't do in a museum. We want to make uh, a building actually where you can do that. And so we are following, the architecture is following the development of art itself. That's the idea. So is it an open air space or is it? No, it, do, it does have a roof. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. 
Thank you again for the talk. Um, I was just wondering how the closure of the museum in 2019 affected the building plans, your, your concept for the depot, um, if it did it at all? No, for the depot, not, not really, because um, uh, the plans, we were building already the depot at that point. We started in 2017 building, so it's not while changing your plans while you're building is really not a good idea. It's, it's not a good idea to changing your ideas while designing it, but while building, it, that would be really stupid and very costly thing to do. So no, it didn't change anything, the closure of the museum. But it, it did, of course, change the way about oh, how we think about the future museum and what we need in the future. No longer questions. I, I do want to thank you a lot for this fascinating talk. And uh, I hope you all go and visit because it's very, very fascinating. Yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs>